Welcome to The Edges of Lean. I'm Bella Engelbach, and in this podcast, we explore the human and creative side of lean thinking, unusual places where lean thinking is practiced. We meet people who are practicing continuous improvement in many different flavors and styles. So come along with me on a journey to the edges of lean. Episode 81, Continuous Improvement and Women in Tech with Lamar Bergman Gross. It's 2022. Well, it's almost 2023 and you might be listening to this in 2023. And women in technology are not unusual, but there's still plenty of female talent not taking part or staying in the tech sector. Lamar Bourbon Gross has time-tested tips on how to succeed as a woman in tech and how to be a great sponsor of women in tech. Lamar's insights apply to women in lean, too. Let's meet Lamar. Lamar Bourbon Gross, welcome to the Edges of Lean. Hi, Bella. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here today. I'm looking forward to our conversation because you are very focused on women and technology. And uh, as some of my listeners know, this podcast came out of the Women in Lean group. Um, It was birthed out of that group. And uh, so uh, how women are successful in the world is of great interest to all of us. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your own career pathway. Yeah, definitely. So hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. So I'm, uh, if I'll start with my career, uh, I started my career as a software engineer. I I studied computer science and accounting in university and started my career uh, as a software engineer. I always work, by the way, predominantly with men, sometimes only with men, sometimes there are one or two other women. Uh, it, It wasn't terrible, but it's just the way it is or the way it was, at least for me. And I, I, at some point in my career, I decided that I wanted to go to leadership. So I started managing. It wasn't that easy, but I'm just giving kind of a highlight here. Yeah. Uh, along the way, I got married <laughs> and raised a family. I have four incredible children. And we also moved countries. So we moved from Israel to the U.S., and in the U.S. we moved <laughs> and we lived in Colorado and in Texas. And then uh, we decided to go back here to be close to our um, parents, aging parents. And when we moved back, I also decided to make a career change because I felt like I can give a greater impact by coaching other women because I've been doing that for the last five years or so. And uh, I've seen the impact I've been able to make. So I decided to focus. I I started coaching uh, and started working with women and with organizations. Basically, I coach women. I also coach men, but my passion is women. Uh And uh, I do different workshops, like for presentation skills. And I also consulted to Power to Fly. It's a company. It's a US-based company. Also focused about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Created a mentorship program with their so I do multiple things. There is no one thing. There is not one title that can describe me. And that's okay, by the way. That's <laughs> and we good. can talk that's about good. that too. Yeah. 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 So it's it's funny, you know, that it's 2022. Um, women have been around for a very long time, right? And we're still having these conversations. Uh, we're, we're still um, wondering why women are not seen in some technical careers, why women who do go into technical careers uh, sometimes are not promoted, or if they're promoted, um, they seem to hit a ceiling. Um, you know, there are, you know, we, we rejoice when we see women in leadership, and we see the difference that the leadership of women makes to an organization, Mm -hmm. but we're still having this conversation. And so from your perspective, as you're coaching women, and can I ask, what's the the general age or generation of the women that you're you're coaching? Um, What are the things that you hear about um, the, the challenges that women are having? Yeah, so I, I coach women from variety of background and ages. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be a very junior softer engineer to a seasoned leader. Uh, but for the most part, I would say they are in their 30s, mid-careers. Uh, and what was the other question you asked about the age well you would yeah about the uh, sort of about about the age but then also then what are some of the things that you're hearing um as I would say especially from the younger women who I would hope are coming through an education system that is somewhat more egalitarian um what are you yeah. what are you hearing about about the challenges that they face? So I think that the cha- first of all, um, unfortunately, we don't see enough women in tech still. I haven't gone to the universities to see what's the percentage like there, but I think it's not as we want it to be. Uh-huh. So there are still more we- more men. And I recently had a coachee and she's she's just starting her career and uh, she said she worked only with men. And it's not a bad thing. I, I, I always want to emphasize that I'm not coming from a victim mentality at all. And I want to change bottoms up. My approach is working with the women rather than saying everyone is biased against that. And, you know, uh-huh. and, and I'm not saying that there are not no issues, but uh, I'm trying to change that from the women perspective. So think about a woman, a young woman, let's say in her 20s, at the beginning of her career, working as a software engineer and she work only with men even more so most of the men in her team are more experienced than her just take that fact yeah and even if everyone is super nice super inclusive and everything is rosy just that fact alone causes her to feel lack of confidence in her abilities is she equal to those men is she capable she feels always insecure and that's that was the mo- i'm just giving an example uh-huh. um, and and that's the kind of work that i do with her not just about the confidence but opening up for possibilities understanding her worth her strength and 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 challenging her uh, and eventually this woman you know was during the time we worked together, she moved to a more senior level and she started doing things. She started taking risks and and yeah. uh, really doing things that she was not comfortable with because she felt like I'm her back, right? She, she needed some, so that's what I'm doing. I mean, they're doing all the work. I'm just there to challenge them, help them take some bold moves. That's what we need. We need yes. women to take bold moves. We need women to be c- courageous and resilient and believe in themselves. And I think this is this, if I had to summarize it all, that is the main challenge that I see. And to be honest, I felt it myself. Did you? As well. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, a lot of times I was insecure. A lot of times I felt I'm maybe not worthy. Uh, I was afraid to ask for things that I should get. I was afraid to ask for money. I was afraid to ask for promotion. I was afraid, and it took me years and and some support, you know, from mentors and from my husband, and you know, to push myself forward. Because we cannot expect someone to give us things. We have to know what we want and push ourselves forward. Yeah, yeah. So, Lamar, one of the things that we talk about in the Women in Lean group is not about saying to, to the people who are in control of things, give us a seat at the table. We talk about creating our own tables and creating opportunities um, ourselves um, rather than, um, you know, waiting for somebody to see us and acknowledge how, how good we are and, and give us that space. It's more, about, it's more about taking the space and seeing what happens when you do that, which is, you know, sometimes you do get some pushback, but yes. um, sometimes it's very positive results um, because, there's still room in the world for more tables, right? We're not we're not out of tables yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. 
when you started yourself as as a young engineer working with men were you bringing with you some internalized messages from school um about about your capability i mean if you you know going to a career is probably something you were passionate about you were probably good at it in school what what were you bringing into the into it yourself when you started out so i mean to be honest with you i started um I started computer science. I don't know if it was because I was very, very passionate about it rather than I was good. Yeah. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, to be yeah. honest with you. And I just decided to go and study computer science. And it was it was nice. I liked it. Uh -huh. To say passionate, I don't know. I mean, again, I'm I'm being brutally honest here. Yeah. And and uh and I I at school, I mean, everyone were men. I was not the only woman, but there were not many women uh, in computer science. And uh, and I started uh, my career actually on my, when I was still studying, on my last year, uh, I, I started working part-time. And I never at any point felt anything, not from university or from the workplace that, oh, because I'm a woman, so no one gave me that feeling. Uh -huh. That's good. Yeah. 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 So it was all in my head. Oh, isn't that interesting? It was all in your head. Yeah. Yeah. It was all in my head. And again, I don't want people to think, oh, it's all our fault. You know, we need to. Yeah. Take it's not black and white. But but I'm telling you, I mean, when I started, I, I I didn't feel anyone felt less of me because I'm a woman. I just pushed myself forward. I mean, from the beginning, I mean, I started working part time. I worked in a very very old system. It was COBOL, and it was oh dreadful. Goodness. It was dreadful, and I knew I hated it, and I didn't want to continue that. Uh, it was okay for the time I was still studying because you know I just had to you know, finish school and it was, yeah. and, and earn some money. So it was okay. But after, as soon as I graduated, I told not my direct manager, which was a woman, by the way, and was completely not supportive. Uh, but the, the manager above her, I went to him and talked to him and said, there's no way I'm going to continue doing that. Either I leave or you move me. I told him which team I wanted to move to. And this is, again, you have to know what you want and tell people what you want. Not always you'll get it. And I told it in a nice way, by the way. I didn't go and like... <laughs> I demand <laughs> yeah, this yeah. new job. Yes. I, I didn't wait combative. But I said, listen, I mean, I'm here, very grateful and so forth. But but this is really not what I want to do. And and there was another team that was working on back then. It was cutting edge technology. It was Java when it was just the beginning of Java. And so, yeah, this is what I want to do. And 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 I was fortunate that he believed in me and he gave me that opportunity. And if he didn't, I probably would have left and went elsewhere. But you need to know what you want, and you need to ask for it. No one is going to hand it over to you. And my manager, my first manager was a woman and she was not supportive. So not always we tend to think, oh, maybe a woman manager will be, you know, it, it, it's not always the case. I think it might have more to do with the ability of a manager to focus on the development of their employee and what their, you know, what their employee to continue to develop and be happy and to be engaged. If the manager for some reason is focused on something else, like I just need people on my team so I can get this work done. Uh, and they don't have that vision of, of how important it is to develop people, allow people to try new things, allow people to try things that they might even fail at then you're going to run into that. And that could be a man or a woman manager, right? That's that's. I think that's independent of gender. And my sense is, Lamar, it's more about wh what that manager is motivated by themselves, right? Uh, and yeah. you don't, we don't always know what our managers are motivated by. They may be motivated by, you know, something else that's going on that we're not even clear about. But how fortunate for you that you had this um, second level manager who was yeah. willing to let you, 
to let you take this leap. And, and it's, it goes so well with what you say, which is, you know, is take the big leaps, you know, go to, go to the, um, you know, do the thing Absolutely. that feels a little bit dangerous and you don't quite know how to do take it. Take risks. Yeah. I, I was taking a huge risk because, uh, I didn't know Java at all. And yeah. the team was uh, all, obviously all men, mm-hmm. they were all very experienced. And I was uh, I was putting myself in a great challenge there because I had to start learning a new language. And, and But I knew that in order to make progress in my career, I always had, and I still believe in that to this day, and I'm trying to do that every day, I had to take risks and to get out of my comfort zone. Yeah. And gosh, if you had decided that I can only, I'm only ever going to do COBOL, you would not be working in tech today. Right. I Definitely. mean, I, maybe, yeah. maybe, but I would be miserable. And, and you'd you be know, miserable. And, and there are people that are doing that. I mean, I'm not talking about COBOL specifically, but like that are staying in the same safe zone where they're not happy just because it's convenient and just because. They're afraid. They're afraid to challenge themselves. And this is not just women, by the way. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, you need to take some bold moves and uh, put yourself in an uncomfortable position to grow. Yeah. That's how growth happens. Right, right. And then and then you have to be willing to sort of uh, take a step back and reflect on, well, how did that work out for me? Right. And what did what did I learn from doing that? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And I can tell you that I learned that if I believe in myself, others will believe in me. I first have to believe in myself. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, because this is what I reflect to others, right? When I came to this manager in this example, I knew what I wanted and I knew that I could do it. And he sensed it. He sensed it. If I went there insecure and asking to be, and I insecure and, 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 doubting my abilities Mm -hmm. you would probably sense it yeah yeah which which is sometimes about um i think you know some uh, so we want to be authentic right so we really we 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 want to be authentic but sometimes we don't have to we don't have to articulate all of our fears right so if you're still in the back of, the, of your mind thinking, I'm, you know, I'm not sure if I could, you know, I can learn this new technology or if, you know, if you're in continuous improvement, I'm not sure that I can lead this or, or support this kind of project because I've never done this kind of project before. Um, there is uh, there is a point to showing some vulnerability, you know, which, and there is also a point to not necessarily articulating every fear that you have. You don't, you know, you can... That's true. And and about showing vulnerability, I mean, I think it depends on the environment you're at. Hopefully in a healthy workplace, it will be it will not be held against you to uh-huh. to share fears or, you know, things you don't know. But it's not always the case. There are places that are very competitive. And I think that's where um getting help from a mentor or from a coach comes into play because a lot of yeah. times you feel uncomfortable sharing what you don't know or sharing fears but you feel comfortable to tell that to someone else and sharing that with someone else can help you yes yeah 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 so as you as you move forward in your career what kind of mentors did you have so my first mentor well actually what happened was um I started uh, my my journey and uh, at some point I was promoted to a staff engineer and back then I realized that I actually wanted to become a manager because uh-huh. that was the diversion the between the tech path and the managerial uh-huh. path and the, and a former manager of mine was my first mentor and uh, was also my sponsor so he was doing two things he he advocated for me and helped me get that manager position and also helped me and mentored me so wow was, that was a gift a go-to person. that was a huge gift yeah 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 definitely yeah yeah so can you define that a little bit more the difference between a sponsor and a mentor and i think because this is sometimes c- confusing terminology to people there's a, you can have sponsors you can have mentors and you can have coaches and they're not always the same people so so tell definitely, us about that definitely 
So a sponsor is someone that knows you and knows your abilities and can help you, can advocate for you. So uh, think about my situation where I wanted to become a manager and I didn't have a management experience. I was, uh-huh. you know, leading teams, leading small teams, working with clients. And he went and talked with the hiring manager who didn't know me at all and said, really, you have to give her a chance. I mean, she's worth it. She's good. So a sponsor is someone that is willing to help you and advocate for you because sometimes you need that external support because uh-huh. it's not enough that you advocate you need to advocate for yourself obviously and push yourself but sometimes you need someone else to come and uh, vouch for you and and say yeah, yeah. she's good yeah. she knows what she's doing trust me typically it would be someone that is more seasoned and um, respectful in in the organization you are at yeah, I think that's really important, isn't it? It's somebody that other people do, you know, do know and respect and especially can re- respect how they evaluate people and whether th- whether they have uh, spotted good talent previously, right? So, Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And the mentor is someone that is uh, there for you to really give you some uh, help you with different questions you have. I'm trying to be careful about saying, give you advice. I mean, because a mentor can give you advice, but I'm personally trying to share experiences rather than give advice or or maybe share possibilities. Because, and the reason I'm saying that is because not always what works for me will work for someone else at a different company. Right. So I can share us. I can share options. I can open. So a lot of times when you're stuck and you don't know what to do, if someone else with exp- with more experience can talk with you and open your up your mind to what else you can do, what other possibilities you have, then you can make a decision which one of the options you want to you want to take. Right, and, and that might be from their own experience. When I had a similar situation, this is how I handled yeah. it, or, or how, yeah. how it played out. Um, yeah, exactly, but, exactly. So I'm trying to not tell people, "Oh, you should do this." Right, <laughs> right, know, because you don't, you you don't know their complete situation anyway, right? As, as a as an outside person, even if you're a mentor from the same organization, you still don't know the exact situation that uh, the person, if you are mentoring, you don't know that their exact situation. Exactly. And and I think the differentiation between a coach and a mentor, at least based on my definition, is that the coach is someone that is coming, really has an ability to listen, uh, is a great listener, knows how to challenge you and ask you the right questions so you can figure out things yourself. And it's typically not someone who is coming necessarily from the same experience or background as you are. So, for example, if I'm coaching, um, I don't know, uh, someone in the healthcare system or whatever, in in industry that I haven't worked at, uh, I may not know necessarily all the details of this person, you know, job, but but I can I can challenge them. I can ask them questions that will help them realize things themselves. And and a mentor is more someone that is coming with experience, right? With Mm -hmm. experience that is similar to yours and can help based on on experience. And I like to call myself somewhere in the middle. So I like to help women in tech leadership, women in engine and more specifically in engineering leadership, because that's where I feel like I bring the most value. So I'm bringing my experience and all my background, but I'm also coaching because I'm really trying to help them figure things out themselves. So I'm kind of combining the, the two. That's my approach. And that's, you know, it's such an interesting thing because when you are learning to coach, one of the things that you're always, you're told repeatedly is to be very careful about when you're coaching and when you're not coaching. So um, in my practice, it's, uh, I think, similar to yours. So I love to coach people who are working in life sciences. Um, And I always have to be uh, very clear with them and and say, I'm not coaching now. Now I am going to, and particularly it's the same thing if they're stuck, right? I'm going to, yeah, let me share with you an experience that I had um, 
but that's not, I'm not doing this as a coach. It's, it's, yeah. it's actually, it's more of a mentor type, type yeah. activity I, when I'll you're doing you that. So, I'll tell you something. I, I believe that there, I, I'm trying to think, okay, there are so many coaches, right? I mean, and good ones. Where do I bring the most value? And I feel that's, that's my, my area of uh, expertise and that's where I bring the most value and why not? Why, why, why throw away all the years that, that I did that work and gain so many experiences? Um, so I believe in the combination of both and, and I've been there also as a coachee in situations where I really needed someone to share with me what they have done. And, and I had coaches and there was, they were not able to, to do that. They were just asking me questions. It was to the point that it was annoying. <laughs> so, okay, I don't need you to ask me questions all the time. Yeah, I don't have the answers. I need you to help me. I, you know, this is, I just think this is great, Lamar, because, because this is something that for me, and, and I don't know if any of my clients are listening, but for me, I always feel a little bit guilty, right? When I step out of that coach role, and I, as I said, I always try to make sure I'm very clear, not coaching now. Um, but, uh, yeah, you're right. Why waste all those years of experience? I mean, there's, exactly. And yeah. I think the problem is that when we get the coaching certification, it, it, you know, especially if someone is uh, getting the ICF certification, it's all around, you know, right. You're, you're coming as someone who is listening and asking questions and not someone who is giving any opinions, any, right. you know, any, right. I mean, I remember one of the training trainers in my coaching program said when I when I enter the coaching room I'm I'm putting myself out of the door I I don't know how to say that but yeah like, yeah I, I, I I'm not I, I'm only a coach I leave all the things outside the door and I have hard time to agree to that to that approach don't you find that that those past experiences, even in the coaching role, inform the questions that you might ask? Definitely, definitely. And I'll tell you something else. I noticed that when I br actually bring myself, it's not about me, right? It, it's all about the coachee. But when I bring myself and I share, I share some things, the connections, the connection is much greater because mm. the person feels, oh, she is actually a human being. She also had challenges. It's much easier for for the coachee to connect that way. And again, I'm I'm mostly listening. I'm mostly asking questions. I'm. It's not about me. It's about them. But yes, bring your. Why not? Yeah, yeah. I I I, re I really like that. And and I know that there's a, a lot of people who coach who listen to this podcast. So so really think about what Lamo is saying. That um, yeah, it's okay to be you, right? You you're bringing something. Um, I think you just want to be clear about what you're doing when, right? You, you yes, and be... again, I'm very very against or very careful about telling people what they should be doing or giving advice even even as a mentor right and um, people should make their own calls based on the situation what is right for them but is yes it's definitely okay to bring yourself eventually people choose a coach based on a personal level right they want to connect to you people who uh, work with you bella like working with you because they like you there has to be some personal connection and i believe that the connection can be built when you bring yourself just a little bit, right? I mean, so people can connect to you as a person. I think that's really true, which is why it's helpful to start a coaching session with, you know, how are you doing? You know, definitely. How's, you know, what's been happening in the past couple of days? How are you feeling? Those are all important ways to start coaching. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, don't just jump in with the questions. Otherwise, we'll be replaced by AI, which hey, is for sure, yeah, for yeah. sure. Or Definite. you know, everyone will get coaching. Listen, I mean, I'm also, I'm also a great believer in differentiating yourself and focusing. And ever, you know, coaching. Everyone can study coaching. Everyone can be a coach. Almost everyone that is has enough intelligent you know right intelligent they have empathy they like to help others and they they are they like they, they know how to listen but what differentiate me from you or from any other coach for that matter 
Okay. It's so it's who I, you are, right? It's who I and am, and, and the yeah. kind of the kind of people I I work with, and and yeah, not everyone is a fit. Not everyone want to work for me with me, and that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. That's really good. I I appreciate this conversation. Lamont, you have you have kids, four kids. Yes, I have four children. Yeah. Yes, yes, and are they? interested in technology so my oldest definitely not she just started college she's into art oh, and lovely. i encourage all my kids to follow their passion and their strength and she's really good she's really good she's a great writer also and i want to encourage her she yeah. actually got a full scholarship for the first year so i said yeah that's your calling go and do it and congratulations my, that's good for yeah. mom and dad too right yeah 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 definitely good but but really i mean i want to uh push my kids to do what they like and what they're mm -hmm. good at passion and strength right i mean the combination of both and uh, the rest i believe the rest will follow because a lot of time people say oh how are you gonna make a living as an artist and i'm saying she can make a living in probably a thousand different ways uh, that I cannot count. So I, I believe that the money will come also. If you're doing what you love and what you're good at, eventually you'll also make a living out of that. And there are many possibilities, not just one. My son, to your question, my son, my second son is now studying, uh, he's in high school. He just started high school this year and he's studying uh, uh, software. Mm -hmm. So he started uh, studying coding and physics and mathematics so he's all about stem good for What's him i mean i'm not trying to push any of the, my kids to anything other than what they they love and uh, what they're good at that's great that's great um i was at the and the reason i asked the question was that i was i was wondering that um you know i'm my my huh. I'm a, I'm a bit older. My my kids are grown, and their uh, uh, their kids are coming along. And one of the things that um, I'm curious about is is what the kids are experiencing as they're being educated now, as opposed to when you were edu being educated. When I was being educated, in terms of the opportunities, or perhaps some of the the cultural um, persuasion that they get to to try one thing versus trying another thing mm -hmm. um, and how that's playing out. So I'll um, tell you something. I mean, uh, my kids grew up in the U.S. until like three years ago. And uh, uh -huh. what I didn't like there, what I didn't like, I love the U.S. and I miss it and, I, and the schools are great and all that. But the thing I didn't like is that the college thing was there from very early age right which college yeah. are you going to go to what are you going to study and kind of a lot of pressure right a lot of pressure you need to choose your it's all practical you need to choose your occupation what do you want to study and all that and i truly believe that we have multiple talents and we can do multiple things like i'm doing today yes and there's not one thing that you're born to do and as much as i I value education and I value higher education. I was, I'm, I'm trying to kind of not put my, my kids in the same way of thinking as I was at, because I was only thinking about something practical, something, okay, what am I going to study that I'm going to make a living? It's not a bad thing, but I didn't even stop thinking about what I wanted. I didn't even stop thinking about what I liked. And that's a shame. That's a yeah. shame because- we should we should spend some time thinking about it. We should explore, right? We should explore possibilities, not just go one. There's one thing that we can do, and and that's what I'm trying. Hopefully, my kids will be able to do, and uh, we'll see. I see, yeah. And everybody goes through career stages anyway. I think that's something that's that ed, that schooling doesn't really take into account. Um, you know that you know we start out doing one thing, and then we transition to other things and the skills that we build along the way that help us move from one uh, career to another career are not necessarily the ones that you learned in physics class or yes yes or for sure. even in even in art class you know so so learning 
learning exactly, you know, how to uh, put paint on paper doesn't necessarily teach you as much as learning how to work with the people who, um, you know, who help you do that. Um, there's a there's a there's a lot more going on than just subject matter. For sure, for sure. So I mean, this way it's not that different, but I think because there is the military service. So my daughter, my daughter didn't enlist to the military because she has an autoimmune disease, and the military, you know, didn't couldn't uh -huh. you know um, have her. And uh, but but generally, kids when they finish high school, they go to the military, and because that there is a two to three years gap, I think that maybe there is less pressure and focus on on the university, on the college in high uh -huh. school than in the U.S. Still, kids choose which kind of uh, elective classes they want to, you know, study yeah. and what they want to do. But there's less direct connection between that to a profession than in the U.S. And, and I think in general, I mean, why do we need to push someone who is 16, 17, 18 year old to choose a profession rather than exploring, exploring possibilities? Yes, we want to, you know, we want them to be independent. We want them to earn some money, but they can earn some money in different jobs, you know, and, and find along the way what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And those, and those kids who are destined for some type of virtuosity, whether it's in, you know, music or something else, they're going to be so passionate about that particular thing. You're not going to be able to stop right so yes so the, yes exactly right there are people who say oh you're you know the, i want to dance or i want to play yeah. some and oh you're not going to make money out of like okay maybe they will <laughs> right maybe, I mean, they, they are, maybe they will yeah yeah let them, let, and you let know, them someone, try someone in the coaching program told me you know because i was thinking about my daughter a lot last year and what she's going to study and first i was trying to think maybe she'll go to architecture right because there, it's kind of art but not really. <laughs> so, so he said to me, there are enough architects in the world. There are not enough artists. So uh, really push her to, to follow her passion and, and, and develop herself as an artist rather than go and being something practical, right. right and as an architect, and there's nothing against being an architect. It's a great profession. And there are a lot of great architects that are doing a lot of things that are very creative, but you know, I wanted to refrain my my daughter to going to study architecture just because it's the practical route. Maybe she will right. study architecture, but I want to give her the time, you know, to think what she wants. I think that's great. I think that's really great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was. Uh... A conversation I saw on Twitter recently, you know, here in the US, US we've had this um, uh, student loan forgiveness program. And, uh, you know, some people were saying, well, I don't want my tax money to go to, uh, you know, people who are studying dance. Mm. And why would an electrician want their tax money to go to someone who's studying dance? And there was an electrician who said, I work in theater. If there's nobody on the stage dancing, I have nobody to light. So mm, that's yeah, hilarious. That's wonderful. And you know, we all need, regardless if this electrician works in, you know, a theater, think about how would we live without art? Right. Yeah. How would you live without art? We can't, we can't. We need it. We need we, art. We need, we need music. music. We need theater. We need ballet. We need so many things, right? I mean, I was with my daughter in Vienna before she started, and we were so we are going to museums and to a ballet and to concert. Like we need that, right? For our souls. Yeah. Yeah. Because it expresses things that we can't say with, with our own Absolutely. little words. Yeah. 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 That's, uh, that's, that's wonderful. So having said all that, first of all, Lamar, how can people find you if they want to continue this conversation? Definitely. So the best way is LinkedIn. Limor Bergman, just look me up on LinkedIn and you'll find me. I also have a web website, limorbergman.com. But I like referring actually to LinkedIn because that's where you can actually start get to know me a little bit. Mm -hmm. As I said, you know, it's all about human connection. Yeah, yeah. yeah LinkedIn, you can, have, you can actually just reach out to someone and have a conversation with them right away. It's really, it's terrific yes, for that. Definitely. Yeah. 
So we've talked a lot about young people already, Lemoy. So what is your one piece of advice for young I think folks it relates starting to out? Every, everything we talked about. Just don't be under pressure to choose one thing you can do. Let yourself explore, try different things, follow your passion and where your strengths are when you're really good. And the rest Great will follow. Great advice. And I love what you said right at the beginning of our conversation for everybody, for women and everybody, dear, just, just take those bold leaps. Give it, give it yes, a try. Definitely, right? yeah. definitely. Yeah. Right, Lamar Bergman Gross, thank you so much for traveling with me to the edges of lean. Thank you, Bella. It was a pleasure. This is Bella Engelbach, and I'd like to thank Lamar Bergman Gross for being my guest on the edges of lean. What did you learn from this conversation? What ideas did it spark? We would love to hear from you. Find Lamar at lamarbergman.com or on LinkedIn. Find me on LinkedIn or at leanforhumans.com or comment wherever you watch or listen. Subscribe and tell a friend about the edges of lean. Please join me in exploring more of the edges of lean. There's a lot to learn and check out my friends in the lean communicators community at leancommunicators.com. You'll find more podcasts and videos with lots of great new content every week. The edges of lean is written and produced by Bella Engelberg with support from podcast Inc. This is a lean for humans production.